What would most people do if their income was taken care of? Would they chase their dreams? When I was a kid, I was sure I was going to be a fighter pilot, or a rock star, or a writer. When, I'm, when I found out I was a pacifist scared of heights, I pretty much ditched the first one. But that's the great thing about when you're a kid. No one's told you there's a box you have to think outside of yet. So you go big. You think it's all possible. When people ask you what you wanted to be when you grew up, you always had an answer. We're born with intrinsic drive. We're also born altruistic. Developmental psychologist Th Michael Tomasello did an experiment on children's behavior with the subject of altruism, on being helpful. A toddler would be in a room playing with blocks when an adult would enter the room with an armful of books. The adult would then go over to a closet and pretend to struggle, bumping into a closet, not being able to open it. In every case with different toddlers, the child would immediately get up and try to figure out how to help the person. It's how we are. Dreaming, ambition, and cooperation are in our very nature. But the world of work we are growing up into has been changing. In our parents' and grandparents' day, a job was the route to a middle class, to security. This was complemented by a robust social safety net built around the time of the end of the Great Wars to ensure stability for those who fell on hard times. And for years, this worked. As production grew, so did workers' wages. But from the 1970s onwards, things started to shift. Wages stagnated and even fell compared to production. Social programs were eroded and defunded, unions and non-wage benefits to workers becoming weaker in a neoliberal view of demonizing those needing social security. The idea was to incentivize work through people having less avenues of support. Work became its own ideology. We went from John Maynard Keynes and even the Jetsons saying we'd be working less and less to what David Graeber talked about in his best-selling book, Bullshit Jobs, where people would confess to him they were doing jobs that they knew didn't really even need to exist. The big idea back then was to create the ultimate free market. What they got was the furthest thing from that, reaping a mess of poverty, polarization, and economic crashes like the mistakes that caused the misery of 2008 and the other downstream effects of despair. I really started noticing it here in Victoria, British Columbia, in where I live in 2011, when the cost of living spiked, homelessness climbed, and it seemed that, to quote a professional salesperson that I talked to where I work, Everyone has a side hustle these days. All of this left us completely unprepared when 2020 arrived. While the top 20 billionaires in Canada made another 37 billion during 2020, our hardest hit by the pandemic were low-income workers, people with disabilities, those on income assistance, indigenous persons, members of the LGBTQ plus community, and other minorities. These are amongst the over 3.5 million Canadians who continue to live in poverty. Jobs have no longer become the way to security and stability. 65% of food insecure households have at least one working adult, and many of our housing insecure population have at least one job of work. We are now wading through a mess that came from the aftermath of the extremely conditional CERB, or CERB, the CRB, and the unforgivable clawbacks that would never happen to co uh, corporations that were given billions of dollars in subsidies. According to Peter Julian MP, it took less than a week for our government to give the banks $750 billion. For those who never thought they'd have to apply for help, people quickly realized the old Social Security bureaucracy was a complete mismatch for today's realities. The amounts are punitively low, with a myriad of paternalistic rules that, that only increase the potential for mistakes. It was not built for the rise of what's called the precariat in the last decade, people relying on gig work, zero-hour contracts, working well beneath their level of training, living a life of chronic instability and insecurity. As income is the top social determinant of health, it is absurd to think people will succeed under such conditions. Over 198 welfare programs create poverty traps with aggressively high marginal tax rates and having to go back to the go to the back of the line to reapply if something happens 
so they can escape total destitution, along with the loss of pharmacare and other necessary services connected to someone's account. This isn't just happening here, but all over the world, getting especially bad in the 90s when, as Jack Layton wrote in his book on homelessness, we lost being the envy of the world for affordable housing. As British epidemiologists Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson explained in their book, The Spirit Level, rising inequality hurts everyone in our society. With rising costs, fragmenting work, automation, AI, and the globalization of manufacturing, it should not be surprising to learn that the kind of park encampments we see here in Victoria are being seen worldwide. They are not the result of one or another specific political entity. Those encampments are the last stand on a commons against the relentless pressure from the rebirth of early market fundamentalism of the 19th century that has morphed into trickle-down, austerity, and now rentier capitalism with debt and finance taking a growing share of the income, overtaking manufacturing, and living off end cycles of our endless debt. Now, despite all this, I always come back to that last vocal ever recorded by the late, great Freddie Mercury. This could be heaven for everyone. And that's because there's another history of a different kind of movement. It's a history that goes back centuries, from the rights of subsistence in the commons in the Charter of the Forest in 1217 that accompanied the Magna Carta, to the writings of Thomas Paine, Bertrand Russell in 1916, American activists like Johnny Tillman and the United Church of Canada in the early 60s. As the idea took clear shape, it appealed across a political spectrum, from the free market economist Milton Friedman to conser and conservative Senator Hugh Segal to Martin Luther King and eventually even Barack Obama. It's been around so long and discussed by more and more people, it, it has gone through and continues to go through many different names, but all of them, like any field of study, fall under one, na under one name, basic income. Basic income is a payment that is available unconditionally and individually on a regular basis to each member in the community. There's nothing you have to do for it, and like your personal health number in Canada, it's non-withdrawable. Basic income isn't a favor or charity, but it belongs to each person as a right. The amount would be enough for a modest but dignified life. It is not a panacea or a silver bullet, but a floor over which no one can fall. And because you always have it, you're always better off for working. It gives workers leverage. It gives the, it gives the power to refuse explo exploitation in and out of the workplace, the power to say no. Canada already has two programs that function like a basic income. The Canada Child Benefit, which creates $2 of activity for every dollar spent in it, and the Guaranteed Income Supplement for Seniors that started back in 1967. Canada also has a huge part to play in the story of basic income. Back in the 1970s, a young economic student, Evelyn Forge, heard about a basic income experiment taking place in Dauphin, Manitoba, in a little Ukrainian farm community near the border of Saskatchewan. For about four years, the entire town had a basic income called Mincom. As the pilot neared its end and was about to go through its findings, a new government came into power and, seeing no need for the project, told the, shelver, told the researchers to shelve the work. Decades later, the then Professor Forge managed to track down the research to a little office in Winnipeg where she discovered 1,800 boxes of raw data. With the help of some grad students, the truth came to light. Mincom had succeeded spectacularly. Crimes decreased, birth weights improved, healthcare costs fell by 8.5%. People kept working, with the only exceptions being young moms who extended their one-month maternity leaves and young boys returning from farm work to get their grade 12s. Years later, Professor Forge would watch, along with others, as history repeated itself. In Ontario, a newly elected Conservative government, despite many promises to the contrary, cancelled the Ontario Basic Income pilot that started in 2017. Despite the pilot's short 10-month history, the results were familiar. People didn't quit work. They spent money on better food, winter coats, and in the case of the restaurant Fresh Fuel, started by husband and wife team Louise and Leanne Segura, they were able to not only focus on their business, but they noticed a growing customer base. They were able to add a food truck, do catering, and their business not only started to secure a profit, but won two municipal awards. 
All of this is similar to dozens of basic income pilots that have been popping up worldwide since the early 2000s. One close to home was an unconditional cash transfer from the Vancouver-based nonprofit Foundations for Social Change, working with UBC to give 50 homeless men $7,500 each. Far from spending it on impulse buys or what critics might suspect, every guy used the money on things like food, securing rents, clothing, transport. The whole thing, saving the shelter system a total of $405,000 for the year. Looking at the potential cost and with the help of the Parliamentary Budget Office, Evelyn Forge found that the amount, the, the amount in the Ontario pilot could be done nationally for after cost savings and other deductions for only about $35 billion compared to the $175 billion for our combined welfare programs and the fact that our country pays over $80 billion per year on the downstream effects of poverty. It is why guaranteed income was mentioned in the Crow Report back in 1971. It is why this had the support of MPs and senators from across the spectrum, Food Banks Canada, Canadian, Social, Canadian Association of Social Work, Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and as a call to action from the, from the report on, the, on murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. Evidence on basic income keeps coming in daily from Kenya to Stockton, India to London, Liberia to South Korea. Trickle-down economics has a far superior alternative. It is time now to finally put our trust in our people. It is time for our economy to grow up. Basic income would be a raise to working Canadians and give a feeling of stability and security that's been sorely missing all these years. Just imagine what it would be like to live in a world where everyone knew when they woke up they couldn't really fail, that their survival was no longer up for debate. Imagine the entrepreneurial possibilities and creative energy that would be unleashed. Not only that, but here in BC, we know things can change overnight. Giving everyone the security of a basic income would work like an automatic stabilizer for whatever comes their way. When it comes to a changing workforce or automation or constant learning, it makes those realities go from concerning to inspiring. Having a floor beneath us means we can embrace and be em embrace being more flexible and use technologies to reach our potential on a higher shelf. We can embrace ideas like a four-day work week without support workers wondering how they're going to cope. We can go from just surviving to growing the future together. We are still those kids that want to do things, that want to contribute, that want to that dream of a better tomorrow. All it takes is venture capital for the people. And there are things you can do right now. Leah Gazan, NDP MP for Winnipeg Center, is back with an, another tenacious push for creating a guaranteed livable basic income in Canada Laurel Collins, many of our Vancouver Island MPs are behind this push as well. I ask you to check out and support Bill C-223 because I believe Freddie Mercury was absolutely right. I believe a better world for everyone is possible. So if you're interested in finding out more about Basic Income, follow Basic Income BC on Facebook. Check out Basic Income Canada Network, Coalition Canada, UBI Works, Basic Income Canada Youth Network, I run, I run my, my account, Basic Income Victoria BC, on Twitter and Instagram, which has lots of information, um, or links to information, sorry, uh, like books, articles, and videos. So I'll ask you the question we started with. What would you do if your income was taken care of? Thank you.